who are a REDS member, you probably already know me. I'm Michael Perry. I've been a REDS member since 1988 uh, when my family and I moved up to Santa Rosa from Orange County. And you also know that I like to talk about Delta Dental. We're going to spend the next hour talking about Delta Dental. Before I get into the topic of the evening, I just wanted to uh, say that we will very much miss uh, Jim Simons, who passed away very recently. Our condolences to Dana and the rest of Dr. Simons' family. He was a great professional, very, very dedicated to the Redwood Empire Dental Society, and he will be much missed. So what to do about Delta Dental? Uh, Delta Dental, if you are a practice owner, has been a significant part of your practice, good, bad, and indifferent, uh, throughout the time that you've been in practice. I was first in practice in 1979. And uh, in tonight's program, I'm actually going to reference the way Delta Dental operated, at least my relationship with Delta Dental uh, as a practicing dentist uh, when, I first, when I first started to practice. And contrast that to what's occurred over my career and what's occurring in the marketplace as, as it relates to Delta Dental today. First of all, I think it's important that we continue to talk about Delta Dental within the context of the history of private dental practice. And so I'm going to start the program just reviewing that history. For those of you that are newer in private practice, you may not be aware of the relationship that practice owners had with Delta Dental at different points in the last 60 years plus. And so we're going we're gonna to start off with some history. I, I do want to say that it's very important when we're talking about strategic planning as it relates to the business of dentistry and as it relates to working with dental benefit companies. Delta Dental is one of many dental benefit companies. And it's important that we're making decisions as individual practice owners not getting mixed up with anything that might um, be considered antitrust. We don't want to be doing things collectively. We want to be doing things individually. So I'm going to be speaking from the context of uh, what you might consider as an individual practice owner. So what's going on in the dental marketplace today is, as it compares to what went on many years ago? The, the bullets that you see on the screen are, are just a way for me to organize my thoughts around the history of dental benefits. Uh, dental benefits started on the West Coast, and they started in Washington in 1954 with the WDS. That's the Washington Dental Service, which is Delta Dental of Washington. One year later in California in 1955, the CDS, the California Dental Service, started, and that today is Delta Dental of California. So prior to 1954, dental benefit companies did not, did, did not exist anywhere in the world. My father, who was a pediatric dentist who started practice in 1950, for the first few years he was in practice, he practiced at a time when there were no dental benefit companies at all and, and there were no patients that had dental benefits. If we move forward to the time that I was a dental student in the 1970s, and up into the 1980s when I was first in practice, most of the dentists that I knew were contracted directly with Delta Dental. Uh, at that time, Delta Dental only sold their premier product, what we would call Delta Premier today. And the fee schedules that most dentists had at that time, this is an anecdotal comment on my part, I don't have any actual data, but based upon my experience in talking to many, many dentists, dentists in those days would set their fee schedule for all of their patients based upon what they negotiated with Delta Dental. So we had a period of time where in most practices, all the patients were paying the same fees. They were paying the same rate. But you have to also realize that in 1979, in the practice that I worked with in, we charged $250 for a full gold crown. 
And since the average plan had a $1,000 annual maximum and crowns were covered in those days at the 80% level, uh, you, you could do four crowns on a patient in a single year and still be under the annual maximum. And you didn't have to be very good at case presentation with somebody else paying for 80% of the treatment. Then we moved into a time when uh, lower fee dental benefit plans came into the marketplace. Uh, what is now called Delta PPO entered into the marketplace as Delta, P Delta DPO sometime in the late 80s. And by the time you got into the 90s and the early 2000s, many dentists were operating multiple fee schedules. They would have a UCR fee schedule, which is the fee schedule utilized for patients that had no dental benefit plans or patients that had benefits where the dentist was not a contracted provider with that patient's particular benefit plan. And those UCR fees were just one of the fee schedules that many dentists had. They would often in, at that time, have contracted fees with Delta and other PPOs that were lower than their UCR fees. And then we've evolved today into this time of fierce competition among dental, dental benefit companies. They're fighting hard for market share and they're trying to un undercut each other by selling dental benefits at lower and lower premiums. And in order to make that economically feasible, they are either not raising or actually reducing the fees that are paid to dentists for services that they provide. In a word, we have a, a diminution of, of pricing of dental services occurring in the marketplace today. So if we look at what I call an indemnity plan versus a PPO plan, I'm defining a PPO plan as one where the dentist is contracted, a contracted provider versus an indemnity relationship where a patient comes in with a benefit plan where they're allowed to select their own dentist. They could select an in-network dentist or select an out-of-network dentist. If they select an out-of-network dentist, then that dentist is charging their UCR fees and balance billing the patient uh, down to the level of the benefit that the, that the plan offers that patient. In a word, uh, when you have an indemnity relationship with a particular plan, that means that that plan uh, allows you to have some benefits, allows you to file claims on behalf of the patient and collect directly from the insurance company, but you don't have a provider contract, as opposed to a PPO plan, as I said, where you have a provider contract and you're limited to the fee schedule that's in that contract, along with many other limitations that exist. So if, you look, if we look at this 10-year period of time where uh, back in 2006, we had 62% of the dental benefits marketplace was PPOs and 19% was indemnity plans. Uh, in, a, in that 10 year period of time up to 2015, we saw the number of PPO plans expand dramatically in the marketplace and the number of indemnity plans actually shrink. And so PPOs dominate the dental benefits marketplace today and the question that most dentists are asking with each one of these PPOs, including Delta Dental, does it make economic sense for me to, to, for me to be a contracted provider? I've got a couple of graphics that I put into slide form just to represent an idea. These graphics uh, are probably not to scale. This particular graphic I put there to show my view of the array of dentists that were contracted contracted providers with Delta Dental in 1979, the first year I started in practice. And what I mean by this bell-shaped curve is uh, of the licensed dentists, let's say in the state of California, the great majority of them were contracted with Delta Dental and that Delta Dental product that they were contracted with was the premier product that we had today. There was no Delta PPO fee schedule. There was only the Delta Premier fee schedule, and that fee schedule was negotiated individually with each dentist uh, on an annual basis. 
And so you had a few dentists over on the left-hand tail who were contracted with many other PPOs uh, other than just Delta Dental. And then you had this very large group in the middle where the only provider contract they had was Delta Dental. And then over on the right-hand tail, you had a small number that were not contracted with any PPOs at all. So I think, I think this bell-shaped curve, even though it's perhaps not to scale, represents what existed at that time. If we look at today, we have a very different situation. Once again, I am not trying to represent something that's to scale. I'm trying to represent an idea. And that idea is that since the primary relationship that most dentists have with Delta Dental is a PPO premier relationship where very, very few patients coming into any practice actually have a premier dental plan with Delta. So the vast majority of fees that are being charged by patients that are contracted with Delta PPO and Premier are the low, lower level PPO plans. And if we add those dentists in with all of the dentists that have multiple PPOs, not just Delta, but other PPOs, that's represented on that left hand bump in the graph. The higher of the two graphs the major, uh, represent the majority of dentists. So if you're thinking in terms of numbers, we have approximately 38,000 licensed dentists in California, and, and a large percentage of those are represented in that left-hand bump. They have either a contract with Delta PPO and no other PPO provider contracts, or they perhaps have multiple PPO contracts, and one of the ones that they're contracted with is Delta PPO. And then the dip in the middle that represents what used to be at the very top of the peak on the previous slide. These are the dentists that are only contracted with Delta Premier. And what we mean by that is, is any patient coming to them for services, they are allowed to charge their Premier fees to that patient, regardless if the patient has a PPO Delta plan or a Premier Delta plan that dentist, because they have an older provider agreement, has permission contractually to charge that higher premier rate. Now that higher premier rate in most practices is still below the UCR. But those dentists do have the ability to charge more when, they, uh, when a Delta patient is receiving services in their office. The reason that dip exists is because that provider agreement that that dentist have is not transferable in any way to another dentist. And so if a practice brings in an associate, if there's a transfer of ownership, or even if the owner moves a significant distance away and changes their address, that older premier only agreement becomes void. And if the dentist chooses to be in network with Delta Dental, they have to sign a new provider agreement which includes the lower level Delta PPO fees. So the number of dentists that are contracted with Delta at that older premier level, that's a shrinking number. And so eventually that's going to go down to zero because every Delta premier only dentist that retires, since they cannot transfer that relationship to any other doctor, that older, more favorable, higher fee contract um, retires with them. And then that bump over on the right hand side, which in my experience, particularly in recent years, is, is a growing number of dentists. Those are the dentists that are choosing not to be contracted with PPOs at all. And that would include Delta Dental. And when you leave the Delta Dental provider network, it has a significant effect on a number of business systems in private practice. And I'm going to talk some about those changes tonight. But I, I think this graphic represents an idea that we might have some intuitive sense of. But I think, I think the, the size of the bumps that you see on the graph, I think we're going to see those. I think we're going to see the uh, dip in the middle get lower and lower. And I think we're going to see the bump on the right get higher and higher.
as many practices decide that their patients are going to be better off and they're going to be better off as practice owners if they're not in the network at all. So when we're contemplating not being in network with Delta Dental, we're contemplating being an out-of-network provider with Delta Dental, how do we think about that? How do we objectify that decision because there in my experience is a lot of anxiety and a lot of emotion around that issue. There are some dentists that are angry because they struggle in their relationship with Delta Dental. There are some that intuitively feel that it's not working for them economically to be contracted with Delta Dental. But sometimes there are not facts to back up feelings. And so, so let's look at some facts and at least as best we can, try to break this down so you can have a better understanding and make the right decisions for, for, for your own practice. Now there is a lot of data on this graphic, and so I'm going to spend some time on it. First of all, I have developed a 20-point scale, which goes from plus 14 down to minus 6. And I have created a number of bullets that are significant variables when you're considering whether it's a good idea to be in network with Delta Dental or not. And for most dentists that are already in the network with Delta Dental, the decision is, do they want to leave the network with Delta Dental? So when they are considering that, um, I use this as a tool to, to try to gauge the relative risk for them in leaving the network. And you'll notice that I've got three different colors. I've got green, orange, and white. And the green, those are critical distinctions. On the 20-point scale, they, uh, they carry a lot more weight than some of the other variables. And then there's one medium variable, and then, excuse me, there's one important variable, and there's three that are, that are in the medium category. So each of these variables is significant, but some are more important than others. And you'll notice that the two at the top, which starts off with the length of the average patient relationship. In other words, if you have practiced in your community for 20 years, and the average patient in your active patient base has been there 10 years, because you'll have some that will have been there 20 years and some that will have been more recent arrivals. So if the average is 10 years, you have a strong brand in your community and you have a lot of goodwill with your patient base. Uh, it, is, it is not unusual for me today to talk to a doctor that's been practicing in the same community for 30 to 40 years. And so with this first variable, those doctors are way over on the plus side. They're, they have, their, their goodwill is very, very strong. Their brand is very, very strong. And it is much less likely when they leave the Delta network that patients will decide to leave their practice over that change. As opposed to a, a, a doctor who just started from scratch the year before, has only been in practice a short time, is not well known in the community, the patients that are in the active patient base have only been there a short period of time, that doctor might be pushed over onto the negative side of that variable. The next one is more subjective. It is difficult to measure sometimes the commitment that a, team, a doctor and team have to the change. If I am working with a doctor that is passionate about being uh, independent in the doctor-patient relationship, they are passionate about not having an insurance company encroach upon the doctor-patient relationship, and that they have a loyal staff that is dedicated to uh, the business transitions that the doctor wants to make, and they're willing to learn what to say to patients, they're willing to learn the verbal skills, that practice is going to be much more successful in a Delta transition than one where the doctor wants to go hide in his office and read journals with the door closed when he is not treating a patient. He just wants his staff to handle everything. He doesn't want to involve himself in something like a Delta transition. Or if there is a key team member that doesn't think the Delta transition is a good idea and is resistant to the notion of a Delta transition, that second variable 
is going to, it, it's going to score a lower number, and, and it is very significant. Uh, the orange one, the percentage of capacity in the a average daily schedule, what that means is, is how often is your schedule full? If we ignore the fact that there's a reality that a, that a small number of patients are going to cancel at the last minute or no show, uh, an efficient practice most of the time has a full, full daily schedule, and you'd like that full daily schedule to be booked out at least a few days. So if I'm working with a practice where the, the, the schedule is booked out weeks ahead, then that's going to be more over on the plus one as opposed to a practice that has gaps in the schedule every day because if they leave the Delta network, they're probably going to have even more gaps in the schedule. That practice's relationship to capacity is not as strong. And then the diversity of clinical skills, that doesn't have to do with necessarily how good a dentist is at specific clinical modalities. In other words, if I have a, a, a dentist who, who tells me they are experts at crown and bridge and operative, but don't have any diversity of skills outside of those two modalities, they're going to need a lot more patients coming through the system in order to be busy, as opposed to a general practitioner that provides a greater diversity of services. If you provide a greater diversity of services, you don't need as many patients in order to fill your schedule. So that bullet does not necessarily refer to how good a dentist you are in the way we dentists uh, like to measure skill. You know, how good are those crown margins? Those things are important, of course, but in terms of a delta transition, we, we want to see an office that provides a wide, wider array of services. And then the percentage of the patient base affected, obviously what that is, is what percentage of the active patients are insured by Delta Dental. In my work doing transitions, the, the highest percentage I've ever worked with in an office was a Northern California office that was 85% Delta. And uh, it's very unusual for me today to see a practice anywhere in California that's less than 30% Delta. So that can range very widely. I would say typically uh, the average practice I go to is, into today is probably 40 to 60% Delta. And then the size of the fee change. And what we mean by that is, first of all, if it's a Delta Premier only practice and all of the patients are being charged Premier rates, there's only the gap between UCR and the Delta Premier fee schedule that's in play. In other words, if the doctor leaves the Delta network and decides to move all of the Delta patients to UCR, that jump is not insignificant, but it's not as great as a Delta PPO contracted doctor who has a much lower fee schedule. That doctor taking their fee schedule all the way up to UCR, it's a much bigger jump. So when you have, when you have a very, very large fee change, at the margins you're going to have a greater attrition of Delta patients when you leave the network. I'm going to have other ways of looking at this but this is when I, when I talk to a doctor about their risk in leaving the Delta de Dental Network, I use that scale, and then if they're nine or greater on that scale, I deem that to be a low risk practice to make a, a transition. Five to eight, they're in the medium area, they're gonna need very strong leadership and a lot of team dedication to the change, and if they're four or less, it's probably not a good idea for them. So with this in mind, if we look back at the previous slide, you can see that if you are a brand new practitioner and you don't have a lot of goodwill, you don't have good branding in the community, that that alone can put you down into the medium risk category, even if you were strong in all the other categories. So the most important things, the ones that allow the transition to be safest are, are, are those first two. They're all important, but they become less important. They have less of an impact on the risk as you go down the list. In my experience, practices in California that leave the Delta Dental Network and they are premier only, they have one of those older Delta premier only agreements. Those are the agreements that existed 
before May of 2014 in large measure. That's a little oversimplistic, but in large measure, if you have a Delta provider agreement that you signed and completed with Delta Dental prior to May of 2014, there's a very good chance that you either have a premier only agreement or you have the opportunity to keep the premier only agreement and, and drop the lower fee PPO agreement. As opposed to anything that was created from May of 2014 on, your, those two agreements are probably uh, attached to each other. They're conjoined and so you either have to have them both or you have to leave the network entirely. As opposed to practices where the provider contract is PPO Premier, which as I explained in the introduction is largely PPO because there's very little Premier out there. If you're PPO Premier, 98% of the Delta patients you're seeing are lower fee PPO patients. You're going to have a larger attrition of your active patient base when you leave the network when you're in that situation because of the fee jump. The fee difference between UCR and Delta PPO has become quite large for most offices. And, and so I see a larger attrition of patients when those practices leave the network. And then to the point on the bottom bullet, you will have fewer new Delta patients come into your practice when you're out of the network. It doesn't go down to zero, uh, but you don't, there are some patients, if you're not directly contracted with their insurance company, they will not come to you. So if we measure loss a couple of different ways. The first way we should measure patient loss is the actual patient numbers. If we agree on an active patient being a patient that has been in for a posted service in the previous 18 months, that's, that's a somewhat conservative assessment in terms of, uh, uh, of active patient measurement, but I think it's fairly standard in the industry. And um, I think you find if you talk to brokers that most of them would agree that it's, it's, it's fine to measure active patients in that way. So if you, if you ask your practice management software to tell you, uh, give you a list of every patient that's received at least one coded service in the previous 18 months, you'll have your active patient list. And then from that, you can determine what percentage of those patients are insured by Delta Dental. Throughout the rest of the program, I'm going to assume that of the active patients that exist in a, in a private practice, and I'm going to say this is a solo practice where the owner and the dentist are the only provider, it just makes the math so much easier to do it that way. We're going to assume that 50% of the patient base is insured by Delta Dental, which is a reasonable assumption. If we look at this graphic, and we are talking about a dentist that is PPO Premier, which essentially means that all of their, or the great majority of the patients that they're seeing that are insured by Delta have the lower level PPO insurance, then we, we can say, well, we'd like to measure the patient base before the transition if we left Delta, and what would we expect the size of the patient base to be after we left Delta? So we're not measuring dollars here, we're just measuring patients. And so if we say with Delta PPO, per the previous slide, that we would expect to lose about 30% of the patients insured by Delta, if we're saying that and we have 50% of our active patients are insured by Delta, we're talking about, we're talking about 30% or 50%, which is 15% of the patient base. And so what you're seeing here is that if we had 1,200 active patients, which wouldn't be unusual for a general practice with just one doctor and one dental hygienist, that would be typical to have about 1,200 active patients. And we would expect to have about 1,020 patients left after the Delta transition. Being aware that all of the Delta patients that are staying are now moving to the UCR fee schedule. If we do the same analysis for a practice that is premier only, has one of the older provider agreements, one of the older agreements that goes back before May of 2014, now we're going to have a smaller loss because the jump from the Delta Premier fee schedule up to the UCR fee schedule is smaller. And so there's less shock to the patients, if I could say it that way, 
and we tend to see only a 7.5% uh, loss of the patient base, and we wind up with, with 1,110 active patients. We've only lost 90 patients in the Delta transition. So if this practice had a long-standing relationship in the community, they'd been in the community for a long period of time, you ran them through the risk analysis that I had a few slides back, this practice, it would be very clear that this would be a good strategy for, for the owner to consider. In my work, I deal with understandable anxiety about what if. Even though in, I've done Delta transitions over 20 years, and the 15% loss for premier only doctors and the 30% loss for PPO doctors has held up very consistently over that period of time. But I do talk to dentists who understandably worry that it's not going to just be 30% loss for them. It's going to be much, much greater. And so what if we ran some numbers? What if we said that we are a Delta PPO provider and if we left the Delta network, we were going to lose 80% of our Delta patients? And I have to say, I've never, I've never experienced anything close to that. But what if that occurred? What would be the effect on our bottom line? What would be the effect on the net profit that we experience as business owners if we transitioned out of Delta Dental and we lost 80% of those patients that were insured by Delta Dental? Now, in order to look at that, we're going to have to make a number of assumptions. First of all, let's assume that that practice collects a million dollars. It's not unusual for a, a general practice with one dentist. In my experience, I find that practices that are insurance independent, that have no PPO contracts at all, which means all of the patients are paying off of the UCR fee schedule, I find that on average those practices have about a 65% overhead. Some of them more, some of them less, but if they have a 65% overhead, that means they have a 35% profit margin. That means of every, out of every $100 that they collect, they, they have a net profit of $35. And, and as the um, PPO contracts within Delta come into play, that profit margin goes down because you have a percentage of the patients that are paying less. The overhead doesn't go down, only the amount that people are paying for services via the Delta fee schedules goes down. So if it's a Delta Premier practice, I find on average they have about a 75% overhead. And if it's a Delta PPO practice, remember that means PPO and Premier, but since there's no Premier coming in, it's essentially a Delta PPO practice. I find that those have an, an, an overhead at about 85%. And that's a very important variable to factor in because we tend to just say, well, if we lose the Delta patients, we're losing the revenue, but we also need to take into consideration what happens to our overhead percentage when we leave the Delta network and all of our patients are paying a, a more consistent fee, with, with, the, with the ideal being all of the patients are paying UCR. I'm going to assume that this practice that we're looking at is operating at capacity, which means the schedule is full regularly uh, in both the dental hygienist schedule and the dentist schedule. And I'm going to assume that Delta is the only PPO that they're contracted with. So if the Delta PPO fees are 50% of UCR, which here in the Redwood Empire, you know, our three counties, Sonoma, Lake, and Mendocino counties, that's generally what I see. Generally what I see when I talk to dentists about their UCR fee schedule and their Delta PPO fee schedule, I find that, I find that the fees for the Delta PPO schedule for, for most of them are about half. Sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, but I think it's reasonable to, to say that the Delta PPO fee schedules for many dentists, many general dentists, are about 50% of their UCR. If we Look at our basic business formulas. The basic business formula is income minus expenses equals net profit. 
You can't get any more basic than that. The amount that you collect, income and collection, revenue, those all mean the same thing, minus your overhead equals your net profit. That's what you actually make. And, and the GP overhead in practices, there's about 40% of it that's fixed. It doesn't change regardless of your relationship with contracted insurance. But the remainder that's variable changes quite a bit. So if you are a GP, as I stated in the previous slide, you're, if you're UCR only, insurance independent, you, are, you have a 65% overhead, Premier 75, Delta PPO 85. And so what, the way that we're splitting that up is we're saying in each case, 40% of the overhead is fixed, or 40% of the total revenue is fixed overhead, uh, to be correct. And then the variable overhead, which includes all of the things that vary within the overhead of a private practice, that changes depending upon your relationship with low fee PPOs. In this case, we're only looking at Delta Dental. So if we have a million dollars in collections and we have a contracted relationship with Delta PPO, that means we have an 85% overhead. It means we have a net profit of 15%. So we're making $150,000. If the collections from the UCR patients, well, if we, if we are 50% of our patients are insured by Delta, which means they have the lower fees, and 50% of them are paying off of UCR, then we are collecting exactly two-thirds of our total revenue from the patients who are paying off of the UCR fee schedule because the Delta people are paying half. And so we have one-third that's coming from the Delta patients, two-thirds that's coming from the UCR patients. If we lost 80% of the Delta patients in a transition. It means we would lose 80% of that revenue that we were collecting from those Delta PPO patients. And that's what you see on the fourth line. On the fifth line, we are factoring in that the remaining Delta patients, those that choose to stay with the practice, are now moving up to UCR. And that's 20% of the original Delta total. So those people, their fees are going to double. And so the collections from those will then be 133200 So the aggregate of that is a decrease in overall collections because we increased uh, the collections on the 20% on the of the patients that stayed, 133,200, but we lost 266,400 for a net loss if we lost 80% of the Delta people of $133,000. Some dentists tend to leave it right there, and I think that's a mistake because if you factor in the fact that this practice is now going from an 85% overhead to a 65% overhead, because of the uh, efficiencies that are there when you have patients that are all paying off of the UCR fee schedule, you'll notice that the loss actually turns into a gain. The reduction in overhead increases the collections $36,830 and that increases the net profit that amount. This analysis is designed to show that if you make all of the changes commensurate with becoming insurance independent and you lost 80% of your Delta PPO patients, you, your net profit would still be higher. I'm not trying to say that that is a simple thing to do and that it's only centered around leaving the Delta Dental Network. It is not. It is centered around leaving the Delta Dental Network, but it's also centered around changing a number of the business systems commensurate with that change. When you are practicing in an insurance independent model, you are in a very different business than when you're in a PPO model. And, and so I think, it's, I think dentists have to be very careful that they don't just abruptly leave the Delta Dental Network without learning in advance how their business systems need to change commensurate with that change. Um, last week we, we had 
what, what for me was somewhat of a surprising announcement from Delta Dental that they were delaying indefinitely the fee cut that they had announced for these three specialty groups. And what many GPs even today I find still don't realize that these three specialty groups, endodontists, periodontists, and oral surgeons, all enjoy the ability to charge all Delta patients their, uh, a premier rate. They don't have to have a special provider agreement just because of the fact that they are licensed endodontists, periodontists, or oral surgeons. They, if they are contracted with Delta Dental, every Delta patient that they see, they're charging a premier fee. For m some of those dentists, the premier fee that, that they have through Delta is also their UCR fee. I would say for most of them, that's not the case. Most of them that I talk to, and this is anecdotal, I don't have any hard data on it, but most of them that I talk to, their UCR fee is somewhat higher than their Delta fee, but certainly they have not faced the need to consider a Delta transition the way GPs have, the way pediatric dentists have, the way prosthodontists have, the way orthodontists have, because the GPs and those other specialty groups, exclusive of these three, are all in the same Delta situation. They have the same challenges and the same dilemmas when deciding whether to stay in the network or leave the network. And in just talking with a few people in the last week since Delta uh, announced that they are, they didn't say that they were delaying the fee change, they were saying they were postponing it indefinitely. I believe that's the language that was in the announcement. And so one of my colleagues said, well, they changed their mind, they're not going to do it. And that wasn't my interpretation of the language. My interpretation of the language is they say they're postponing it indefinitely. That means they're going to do it in the future, but they're not telling us when. I think this is certainly COVID related. I think that is a, a very safe statement to make. And uh, I, if I were a specialist in one of these groups, I would do some strategic planning and be, pre be prepared for that change to return at another time. And, and what, what Delta had stated they were going to do was take these specialists, and I believe in California, this would affect about 2,200 uh, dentists, uh, that they were going to cut the fees significantly. Uh, for many of the dentists, that would have been a 30% fee cut down to the Delta PPO level. So I think, I think it's safer to assume that this is a, a temporary reprieve. No one knows. I'm not even sure the people at, at Delta Dental have made a decision, but I think it would be naive to assume that they have decided to just never make that change. I think, I think in, in the minds of the decision makers at Delta Dental, they are in a very competitive marketplace and they have a perception that they need to control the amount that's paid to providers in order for them to be able to compete with their competitors. That's the business, that's the logic that, that uh, they're utilizing in justifying how they pay providers in general. And, and so I, I don't have any inside knowledge uh, nobody, to my knowledge, in organized dentistry has any inside knowledge about that. Uh, we will see what they do. Uh, but if I were one of these specialists and I was a practice owner and I was planning for the future, I would put together some contingent plans in case Delta comes back and declares that on a particular date they're going to take these three specialists and put them in the same category that the GPs and the prosthodontists and the orthodontists and the pediatric doctors are already in. So let's look at, let's look at some assumptions for an analysis if you're in one of these specialty groups and you're going to have your fees cut 30%, what is that actually going to, how's that going to affect your personal income? How's it going to affect the net profit in your practice? Well, once again, let's assume you're practicing alone and you're collecting a million dollars. These specialty groups tend to have lower overheads than GPs on a percentage basis. So if we assume a 60% overhead uh, with endodontists, it tends to be a little lower than that. 
with oral surgeons perhaps a little higher and periodontists right in the middle. Uh, but we can safely, I think we can s safely say that a 60% overhead is a, is a reasonable place to start. We're going to assume that half the practice is delta. Uh, we're going to assume that that specialist is matching their UCR fees to their Delta Premier fees, which, which is a big assumption. It's, a, it's an assumption that I, I, I want this analysis to, to be conservative. If, if, your, if your Delta fees are, are significantly lower than the UCR, then the fee cut affects you more profoundly than otherwise. But let's assume that you're matching your UCR fees to your Delta Premier fees. Let's assume that your reduction is going to be 30%. And let's, let's assume that your overhead per patient is going to remain the same after the fee cut. That unlike the GPs, which tend to see a reduction in the percentage of overhead, let's assume in this one that, that the overhead is going to remain the same. Well, then the math is fairly easy because if you were collecting a million dollars and you had a 60% overhead, then your net profit was 400,000. If you experience the 30% fee cut on half of your patients, that means you're experiencing a 30% fee cut on $500,000. Remember the UCR fees and the Delta Premier fees were the same in this example. So that means a reduction in collections of $150,000, which means the net profit now goes down to $250,000, and that's a net loss of over 37% for that practice owner. That is a huge change. That's a monstrously large change. We're, we're talking about dentists losing over a third of their income, and if I am wrong, and Delta is never going to do this, and you're never going to have to face this, it's not going to cause you any problems to think about it and do some contingent, contingent planning. But I, I, I just don't expect, based upon what we've seen historically with Delta Dental, what has happened to GPs and, and the other specialty groups, and what has happened to their fees, and Delta Dental's behavior as they try to compete with other insurance companies that are selling dental benefits for less and less, I just, I, I'm not optimistic that, that Delta is not going to return with another fee cut at another time in the future. We'll, we'll see whether I'm right about that or not. And so just realize if you're a specialist and you're doing a Delta transition, it's not the same as doing a, a GP transition. Because if you're an oral surgeon or, or an endodontist, you don't have a recall program. So, so the way that you look at active patients is very different than say a periodontist or, or a general practitioner that have recall programs and have patients that are regularly coming to them. Also specialists, many of them are very reliant on referrals. Uh, referrals in particular from GPs but also from other specialists and physicians. So if you're doing a Delta transition and you're say an oral surgeon, you need to engineer your transition in part around maintaining those referral relationships. Some of the dentists that refer to you may be nervous if you're leaving the Delta network. They may misunderstand what it means to them. If uh, you need to talk with me about anything that I've talked about tonight, uh, we don't have to center the conversation on Delta Dental, but in my work in the last year or two, most of the conversations I'm having with dentists are about Delta Dental. Delta Dental is very much in all of our minds and I think as much as we can we want to take the emotion out of our strategic planning concerning Delta Dental, try to be objective about it. Certainly we want to do the math, we want to assess the risk, and if we're going to do a transition, um, in my experience you only get a chance to do a transition well one time. Um, so I will, I will close with that. Martin, did we have any questions that came in on anything? So uh, since we have no questions, it's Tuesday night, and um, most of you are probably going to work on Wednesday morning, so I'll let you go. I appreciate everybody's attention.